Um, <clears throat> thank you for coming. Um, I will say that I've never received a introduction that only required me to then die and be buried to make it a complete success. <clears throat> uh, I don't know. Can you hear me okay? Do I need to use a microphone? Uh, <clears throat> I feel like Mariah Carey if I'm holding a microphone. <clears throat> <clears throat> so uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you. I will start out by saying I know Brother Ritchie fairly well and have gotten to know him much better. Uh, we are circulating a, a new set of hymns for him to whistle because we're really tired of the ones he's been whistling <laughs> for the last two years. <clears throat> so we're going to give him some new ones. <clears throat> but I also am completely aware of the fact that I was not his first choice, that the guy who stepped out and was able, wasn't able to make it today, um, he tried four other people to fill his position, <clears throat> none of them were willing to do it. <laughs> and so I, I know that, uh, that I'm not the first choice and I'm not disappointed by that, um, but uh, you have a lot of people who are very, very capable of talking to you and, and I think that's fairly unusual to be at a university where people are interested in speaking to you, willing to speak to you, and, and hopefully have something useful to say. <clears throat> so, um, I, I know this is typically a, a meeting where the speaker passes around his uh, balance sheet and tells you how much money he's worth or how much money he's made, and, and uh, I'm not one of those who does that. Um, you <clears throat> wouldn't be able to read my balance sheet, it's way too confusing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but besides that, um, not to discount Brother Ritchie or any of the other speakers, I, I fundamentally believe that uh, uh, money is, is merely a metric to determine how well you've done and says so remarkably little about who you are as an individual that, that uh, I would be embarrassed on both fronts, good and bad, if it were used to determine who I am. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Brother Ritchie asked me to speak for a few minutes. Uh, then the, earlier this week he said, and, and by the way, cut it short because the career fair is going on and I think people would rather be at the career fair. So <clears throat> uh, I will cut it short, uh, but I would like to share a few ideas with you with the intent that it would make a difference in how you plan your lives and in the things you do for your lives. <clears throat> and one of the great surprises to me in, in the position of being a professor here is how many students come and ask you what they should do in particular what they should do for a living. And as a professor, it's an absolutely impossible question to answer. And I usually answer it by saying, well, what do you like? And what's remarkable is that very few people really know what they like. Um, <clears throat> and so the tools that I'm going to try and talk to you about is, are specifically indifferent about what you choose to do, but should provide you with sufficient understanding of the elements of success in any field uh, that you would be able to pursue those. I'm going to do it differently because I, I think uh, to those who are truly boring and interested, you can actually look at the previous speech that I gave when the last person didn't show up. <coughs> and uh, you can see that if you want to. But I wanted <coughs> to talk to you about failure today uh, because failure is the most important element of success that you will ever find in your lives. And it seems somewhat counterintuitive because these meetings are often um, introducing people who seemingly are following a pattern of fairly smooth, consistent cadence of incremental success. Or they've risked it all on red and happened to be right. Uh, and succeeded wildly monetarily. Um, <clears throat> none of those things I find to be particularly rewarding or character building. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the benefits and the elements of failure and how we learn from failure. To do that, I'm going to draw <clears throat> two historical uh, perspectives. The first one, think quietly, carefully, about a very, very stormy, dark, depressing evening where a group of 12 individuals had convened because just previous, their master, their lord, their savior, their who they perceived to be their redeemer had just been convicted and sentenced to die. Jesus Christ had gone before the Sanhedrin 
had been convicted um, <clears throat> inappropriately and against the law, then went before the Roman procurator and had been handed back to the Jews and told, look, go and terminate his life. Go and kill him. Um, <clears throat> the Lord was crucified, and the disciples were then terrified. You could imagine if your community of, of Jews had turned against you, the Romans who controlled your country had turned against you, and they had just killed your master for the things that he taught, and now the 12 apostles who taught the exact same things as the Savior uh, were now terrified for their own lives. They thought they would be tracked down and, and murdered as well. What the Romans thought and what the Jews were sure of is that there was nothing more predictable than the end of the Christian faith, the end of those who followed Jesus Christ. The reality is <clears throat> the 12 apostles sat in a room and sat there and talked to each other about what their fate was. Were they to run? Uh, were they to stay? Uh, what were they going to do? And they were talking about the failure of what they thought was this Jesus Christ. I thought he was supposed to be the Savior. I thought he was supposed to be the promised Messiah. He was going to lead the Jewish people. And now he's dead on the cross and uh, soon to be put into a sepulcher. Nothing was more predictable than the failure and the removal of the Christian faith from the earth. Fast forward. <clears throat> now we're looking at uh, June 27th of 1844. Uh, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, Sidney Rigdon, oh, no, Sidney Rigdon, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, John Taylor, Willard Richards are in the upper room of Carthage Jail. And shots ring out, <clears throat> and Joseph and Hiram are, are mortally wounded. Uh, this was the objective of the mobs, was the objective of the legal um, circumstances and legal leaders of the time, was to destroy the leaders of the Mormon faith because there was nothing more certain that if you could destroy the leaders of this faith, that the faith would crumble. Uh, there was no substance underneath it. And so the outcome of both of those events is fairly well known. Uh, the Christian faith continues to be one of the fastest growing religions on the world or on the earth. Um, and in that faith, the fastest growing component of the Christian faith is the Mormon church. Um, both of which were absolutely destined for failure and for removal from the earth. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you about failure, and I want to do it from the Mormon perspective. By and large, because you are either in the church for generations and you have the culture of Mormonism deeply ingrained in you, or you're a convert to the church, in which case you've sort of adopted the Mormon culture and the things that we bring into our culture, both good and bad. But I want to talk to you about failure. <clears throat> and these failures and the failures in our lives, because I want you to stop fearing failure. If you came out of this meeting and all you did was say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about failure. I'm going to willingly, openly, and publicly fail. Because you know what, we followed this guy Joseph Smith around, and he got all these Mormons to give money to a bank. A prophet starts a bank that then fails absolutely monumentally and everybody who put their money in lost it. How in the world could you follow this guy around? A guy then says, you know what, we're going to have polygamy. His wife was obviously not in line with the whole polygamy program. <clears throat> and so Joseph sort of secretly takes on a couple of wives. And because Emma would be truly ticked off. I think my wife would be right there in line with Emma. Um, <clears throat> and you know what? Uh, we still follow the guy. How does that happen? Because he was a prophet. Because he was speaking the words of God. Because he did see what he said he saw. So we watched Joseph Smith pass away. Uh, it, was, it could have been, must have been the saddest experience in the, in the history of Mormonism. And then the saints followed a group of 12 men across the plains in the largest migration, uh, certainly in modern times. <clears throat> so how do we recover from failure? What do we learn from failure? And why is it that only successful people say they learn so much from failure? And the reason is, is that for most of us, failure is transitory. Failure is a point in time 
usually a relatively small point in time in our lives. But we learn the most from failure than we do from successes because we rarely analyze our successes. We succeed and we think it's all because of us. We succeed because we look at those events and say, great, I succeeded, I'm now a millionaire, I get to spend my booty, I get to spend the loot. But failures are different because failures live with us in our hearts. Failures guide and instruct every decision we make after the failure. So we learn much more from them. Failures are bitter and we are constantly burping them up over and over and over again and tasting them anew because they're instructive and we can learn from them <clears throat> but we cannot continue to chew them over and over and over again. I would bet that all of you have failures from your childhood that you constantly remember and sometimes you'll be sitting in a church meeting and listening to a talk and you'll remember one of those failures and your body will physically twitch because of the remembrance that is coming into your mind. I do that. I do that still today. I do it still today from failures I experienced when I was 10 years old. And it impacts me. So I'm just going to talk to you for a minute about what to learn from failures in the context of being a Mormon, in the context of being a young person whose life is ahead of them and whose opportunity set is endless. First thing I'm going to talk about is safety. <clears throat> um, I have a very good friend whose name is Stephen Robinson. Some of you may have read one or more of his books. He wrote the book Believing Christ. The essence of the book is that we believe the teachings of Christ, but we believe that they apply to everyone else. We believe, believe that God truly loves his children, but not me. And the essence of his book is that, you know, we have to not just believe in Christ, but believe the things that he said. But one of the things that Steve Robinson does is he is involved in interfaith dialogue, which basically means he brings a bunch of Mormons together, a bunch of Jews together, a bunch of Pentecostals together, and they talk to each other. And they share ideas with one another. And they share their, their philosophies, their principles, and their concepts about what faith is and what God is. <clears throat> and he's become very successful at that. And part of his efforts have significantly increased the understanding of the church around the world. Well, on occasion, he had one of his friends who was the leader of one of the Pentecostal groups, and they came to his home, and he spent the weekend with him. <clears throat> and he said, will you go to church with us? And you'll know this for some of your <coughs> Pentecostal friends. That's a big deal to go to a Mormon church because we're sort of the bad guys. And he said, absolutely. I'll go to your church with you. <clears throat> now, Steve Robinson lives in a very densely populated Mormon community in Provo uh, where there are church buildings on every block and so he took his friend to church. He went through the first meeting, he went through the second meeting, went through the third meeting and he came home <clears throat> and they had dinner together and Steve said, so how did you like it? He said, absolutely loved it. He said, I am absolutely convinced that you believe in Jesus Christ because I heard the name of Christ and the principles of, that Christ taught mentioned not, uh, numerous times. He said, so what else did you think? <clears throat> and they talked about it for a minute. <clears throat> and then he said, I have some questions for you. Now, when they had left for church, they left from his house and literally they walked probably uh, 50 yards, another 50 yards down another road, and that was their church building. And his Pentecostal friend said to Steve, do you have a lot of people killed on the way to church? He said, no. He says, why? He says, because I was in three meetings, and in every meeting there was an opening and a closing prayer, and in every single prayer, the person blessed that we would get home safely. <laughs> <coughs> and he said, I walked to church. I didn't see much that was really risky. You live in a nice neighborhood. What's the deal? What am I missing? And Steve was struck by this <clears throat> because it is a cultural impediment to our faith. A faith that is willing to leave everything on multiple occasions and leave everything we own to leave our city and go for a place called Utah, which by any comparison to where they were leaving is a dump, to go to Utah on a bag of flour and a few other morsels of food and a handcart 
is remarkably risky. But we have become a faith of safety. We've become a faith that is constantly focused on doing things that keep us safe, which is completely contrary to everything we believe. We fundamentally believe that those who are kept safe by God by some way have earned his favor and that that favor has come by their diligence or worthiness, which is absolutely false. So the first thing I would say is be risky. Risk. I'm not talking, please don't get me in trouble with the stake presidents in the campus, about gambling. <clears throat> I'm talking about taking risks, going outside of the box, doing things different. The reason why is because you will never achieve the objectives of the church, the prophecies that God has set forward, by being a potted plant in your ward. The number of wonderful young men and young women who come into my office and say, what should I do? I'd say, what do you want? I want to have a family and I want to earn lots of money really fast so that I can go on missions. And I just roll the eyes back in my head and think, you have no idea what you want. Because what we want to do is we want to be an instrument in the hands of God. We want to influence people. We want to matter. And the only way you will matter is if you risk, if you step out and do things that you would not otherwise do. Joseph Smith was a risker. He risked building a bank, and he failed. He risked building a church, and he succeeded. Uh, you will fail, and you will learn, and you will succeed if you keep moving forward. Sir Francis Drake, uh, who... <clears throat> was a gentleman that some of you know from your history courses from the 1500s, was a seaman, a captain, was a son of a preacher, a preacher who was a Protestant and was constantly lived a life of persecution. He said this, <clears throat> Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little. When we have arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of the things we possess, we have ceased to thirst for the abundance of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in the efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of a new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of the land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push us in the future in strength, courage, faith, hope, and love. I wish that that would be something, if we could tattoo things, but we can't. If you could tattoo something on your body, I wish you would tattoo that on your body and watch, look at it every day. <laughs> Um, again, don't tell your bishop, I'm going to be in trouble for that one too. <clears throat> but we have in this university a culture where 70% of the students come from other countries. And you know what, we have sort of a problem with the other countries because you come here and you get educated and you see the opportunity set that's available for you in your life and the first thing you want to do is stay here because it's more comfortable and safer here. Okay, that's not why you're here. You're here to go. And because we don't do that very well, the Lord's going to change the world significantly in your lifetime. And this is what's going to happen. The United States is no longer going to be the most important country in the world. And it's not that the United States is going to fall apart, although it's very likely to do so. What's really going to happen is that the rest of the world is going to rise. And the opportunity set is going to shift from the United States to the rest of the world. And the reason why it's going to do that is because the Lord needs you to get out of here. And he needs you to go to the countries where the opportunity set is the greatest because he needs you to succeed and he needs you to spread the gospel there. So stop seeking for safety. Seek for opportunity. We have a thing in our family and I sincerely don't encourage you to do this because our family is monumentally screwed up. <clears throat> but we have a thing in our family where we move around a lot. We were on our way to BYU Idaho with four tractor trailers full of stuff that we had accumulated over years. Because we're going to go teach at BYU-Idaho. 
And the job that we were going to take was literally revoked from us as we were driving to Idaho. We received a letter from the president of the university that said, we're so happy you're coming. <laughs> when we moved our stuff and we were on the road. Um, the person whose position we were taking decided not to leave, so that position was revoked. Um, so we decided to come here for a few months, uh, which we did. But every single time we have moved as a family, as our family became older and could engage in the conversation, we'd sit around the, 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 the table and we'd say, okay, what are we going to do? And when we considered a moving option, we would say, are we going for comfort or opportunity? And I will tell you, amongst the children who have, have been old enough to vote and talk, Comfort has never, ever won. Opportunity has always won. We often think we're doing our children and our family this great favor by enforcing and encouraging them to be comfortable. And it's never been the case. It has never historically been the case. Uh, it's an illusion. An illusion very similar to the thirst for leisure, which has equal problems. So forget safety. Um, <clears throat> look for opportunity. The next one is learning. Your world is changing very fast. Now back in the olden days when Brother Ritchie was your age, <coughs> he knew Joseph Smith personally. <coughs> back in the olden days, <laughs> the world didn't change very fast. Everything moved a lot slower. That's why he walks so slow. It's not Hawaii. It's just the era he grew up in. And then with my era, things moved a little bit faster, but I can remember the first computer when I got home off my mission. And the internet was something that existed but nobody knew about. Now you have things moving so quickly that your biggest problem will be how fast you can learn. The experiences you're having at the university now are learning experiences, hopefully, but you need to disabuse yourself of the idea that learning is over when you graduate. The days when you can get an education, get a degree, learn the stuff and then spend the next 30 days doing it are over. You have got to be learning every day of your life and you've got to put that as the priority for everything you and your family does. Warren Buffett, who is largely considered to be the best investor in the world, works with a guy named Charlie Munger, who's his companion, his partner. <clears throat> Warren is always the one who's out in front of people. Charlie's a, a really a bookworm uh, accountant type who never really likes to look at the sunlight. But <clears throat> Warren Buffett's the guy in front. Here's Charlie Munger. And Charlie was asked, he says, why is Warren so good at what he does? And he gave two answers. One is he's a learning machine. He is constantly reading, constantly learning. The second one is he has a very high capacity for boredom. And this is one that's worthy of a little bit of extension. You live in a society and in an age where everything is gratuitously given to you. <clears throat> I'm not talking about being spoiled by your parents, although I suspect that most of you have that problem as well. Um, I'm talking about how you get information. Information is instantly available and already summarized for you. And because it's summarized for you, you rarely ever are forced to dig into the details. And I can tell you that the details are absolutely essential. If you live your lives with the summary versions of everything, you will not succeed. Because success is determined based upon details, based upon experience and understanding, which you can't get from summaries. So be careful of that. Do not allow yourself to be distracted. If you were to have looked at a movie back when Brother Richie was your age, your average scene length would have been about five minutes. The movie would have spent five minutes on a scene. In the next generation, which was me, <coughs> the scene length would have shrunk to about three minutes. In the next generation, which sadly is you, the scene length has now shrunk to five seconds. If you want to test my theory, watch The Born Identity and see how quickly the shots change. And do you know why they change so fast? Is because you lose interest. Because your brains are no longer wired for concentration. When is the last time you sat down with a book 
for one solid hour and never did anything but read. Your cell phone was not buzzing, your cell phone was nowhere near you, but you just read and tried to understand the material. If you want to be successful, the best thing I can tell you is start today and read everything you can get your hands on and spend at least one hour a day in doing nothing but reading. The second thing is, memorize one scripture every day and don't let it be Jesus wept or my father dwelt in a tent. <clears throat> memorize one verse every day. And the reason why this is important is because it'll dramatically improve your memory. It changes, fundamentally, physically changes the wiring in your brain so that you can remember things easier so that the things that you study and learn will be remembered. And the reason why it happens and works is not because scriptures are better than other things. It's because scriptures are weird. And scriptures don't follow syntax. And they don't follow thought processes. And if you can memorize a scripture for two years, one every day, your memory will be significantly enhanced. And the things that you learn will be kept uh, for you and you won't be, uh, you'll, you'll be dramatically ahead of everyone else. <clears throat> um, next thing about learning, um, the temple. Most of you have been in it. It's stunning. It's beautiful. The church spent tons of money on the temple, but that's irrelevant. What is important about the temple is that nothing in terms of quality was spared. Next time you go to the temple, look at the baptistry, look at the bronze railing around the baptistry, and think about this. It had to be replaced, and it was replaced at the last minute. And the reason why it was replaced is because there were some color variations in the welding on the railing. And the people in the church said, no, it's not appropriate for a temple. We need to change that. And you know what happened was they went to the contractor and the contractor said, it's good enough. And the church said, no, it's not. And the problem that you have in your generation is you are often content with good enough. And you can't be. Um, you can't be for a lot of reasons. You can't be because the Lord doesn't want you to be. But you can't be because it'll never lead you to success. If you start in your education today and then the rest of your life and it'll never allow yourself to say it's good enough, you will always succeed. Categorically, promise you, if you never allow yourself to say it's good enough, you never allow yourself to hand in a report or a test or anything else that is good enough, you will always succeed in your life. Absolute promise. The last one, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to hurry here, uh, <clears throat> is commitment. Um, I heard a, a quote from Hiram Smith, not the Hiram Smith, Brother Richie knew the Hiram Smith, I'm talking about a different Hiram Smith, <clears throat> who, who said, character is the ability to carry out a decision after the emotion of making the decision is passed. If you can memorize that and repeat that to yourself over and over again, because you know what, we're really good starters, but we're really good, we're really poor follow-throughers. Think of the excitement that you feel in a stake meeting where you're enthused and you think, I'm gonna do my home teaching every single month and I'm gonna do a great job, and then the next month comes around and you've lost it. The inspiration's gone. So character is the ability to carry out a decision after the emotion of making the decision is passed. You're committed. You're going to deliver on it regardless. The Greeks, <clears throat> when they would, were in their era of conquest, would take the beauty of living on an island is you have to get in a boat. So they couldn't fly in those days. You have to get in a boat to go anywhere. So if they're going to go take over another place, they had to get in a boat and go. <coughs> So they got in their boats, they went to the other island, they beached their boats, and what is the first thing that the commander did? Burned them all. Because there's no retreat. And so the first thing the commander does after he lands his army is burns the boats and then says to the soldiers, we're here for a singular purpose. And guess what? If we don't win, there is no retreat. That's commitment. Don't give yourself an option. And I failed in my life from this because I have always had a plan B. 
And the Lord had to really shake me up and get rid of my plan B's and so that I would be committed to some things. And take away your plan B's. Exercise character, the ability to carry out a decision after the emotion of making the decision has passed. Burn your boats. Make a decision and burn your boats. Now I'm going to tell you one last story. I'm going to be fairly quick. The story of the 5,000, most of you know it. <clears throat> you know it's one of the few um, stories of Christ's life that are narrated in all four Gospels. Most of them we get patches of here and there in the different Gospels. Feeding of the 5,000, we get in all four of them. <clears throat> and it's important because jo or Jesus had just heard that John the Baptist was beheaded. He was obviously down, depressed a little bit about it. So he said, you know what? <clears throat> Let's take the disciples or apostles. We're going to go off into the country. <clears throat> so he goes off into the country, but by this time, jo Jesus is very well known, and he's followed. They get into a boat to try and go somewhere else, but everybody's following him along the shore. So Jesus has compassion on him, gets out of the boat, and goes into what they call a mountain, you would call a small hill, and they begin to teach. What happens is they teach in the customs of Eastern society are such that if it's evening and you're teaching somebody, you're feeding them too. And there's 5,000 people, men, probably another 5,000 women, probably another 5,000 children, <clears throat> And Jesus and his disciples are now responsible for feeding the multitude. And so they scour the group. <clears throat> they find a kid who has five small barley loaves and two small fishes. And there's 15,000 people there. And so <clears throat> the, the Lord says to his disciples, uh, what are we going to do? And the disciples immediately raise the white flag and say, send the multitude away. Get rid of these guys. We can't feed them with five small barley loaves and two small fishes. And then they turn to Philip, who's sort of the money guy, and they say, well, how much money do we have? And he's going through his pockets for change, and there's nothing there. So he says, you know, we, we got no options here. And what does the Lord say? Seed everyone. What kind of faith does that take? Seed everyone. Let's bring the barley loaves and fishes and the Lord blesses and breaks the fishes and the barley loaves, sends them out to the multitude. They ba take back 12 baskets full. And that's important, but it's not the key thing. Then what happens is they dismiss the multitude. But Jesus does the dismissing. He sends the disciples off into the boat. Jesus dismisses the multitude, goes to the top of the hill, and begins to pray. The disciples are on the water. They're on the water till 3 in the morning, rowing in a storm, about to die, and Jesus goes to the uh, water and calms the waters and saves his, his disciples. But that's not the miracle. The miracle is the boy. The miracle is as little as he brought, he brought it all. And all was enough. That's the miracle in the story. And we miss it almost every time. We watch the Lord in the mountain watching his disciples. And that's important. It says a lot about who Jesus is and who our Heavenly Father is. And we watch the stilling of the waters, and we watch the feeding of the 5,000, and all that's important. But the most important part of it is he brought very little, but he brought everything. If we are committed and we bring everything we have, don't go halfway. We acknowledge up front that it's not enough, but we're not the one that's going to break the bread. That's the Lord's job. Have faith in him that he will be with you at every point in your life, breaking bread and breaking the fish, and it'll be enough. Have that faith, and you can be committed. Years ago, <clears throat> this is the end. Years ago, I had the opportunity to meet a wonderful man named, um, <clears throat> I'll save his name for just a minute, see if you can pick it up. He was influential in the world of microfinance. He, in fact, started and created the whole idea of microfinance. And I had the chance to meet with him in, in Washington because I was working on some things with microfinance, and he was intrigued by what I was doing, and he asked to meet with me, and I was excited to meet him. I'd never met him before. <clears throat> and in your life, there will be very few experiences when you will sit down with somebody and you will feel like you never want to leave. You feel by their presence that you are in the presence of greatness. And reality is, it's never the CEOs, it's never the presidents, it's never the kings, 
and I've sat with all of them, and I never got with that feeling. But sitting in the front of this man named Muhammad Yunus, I felt like I wanted to stay there forever. I felt like I was really learning something from this guy. And so I had the chance to do a little travel with him, and I traveled with him to Salt Lake City. He was receiving a big award there from the church. And I invited my parents up to meet with him, and they met with him and got their picture taken with him. And <clears throat> I sat down with him in the, in the lobby of the hotel, and we were talking, and he said, make me a promise. I said, okay. And I don't know him well. I just had met him a few days earlier. And uh, I said, okay. And he said, never do anything that doesn't change the world. I thought, that's hard to do. And he says, no, it's not. You change the world by changing a diaper. You change the world by spending time with people. You change the world by succoring people who are in need. You change the world by giving. Um, <clears throat> and I was influenced by that. And I, I admit that I have not done that every time. But I think about it every time I do something. And the experiences in my life where I have followed his advice have been life-changing have been amazing. And I trail back over my life and the accomplishments of my life and the things that I have done and the things that I want to be known for. And they're all those experiences. Has nothing to do with making millions of dollars. Has nothing to do with being the number one person on Wall Street. None of that even matters. In fact, I don't even think about it. I think about the little experiences where I did like Muhammad asked me to do and do something to change the world. So may I suggest, my friends, and you are my friends, and I know you're young, and you often think that people like old like me and Brother Richie don't understand you and can't possibly love you because we don't know you. One of the great miracles of your life as you get older like me and really old like Brother Richie is that you start to live the way the Lord lives, and you start to realize that you really can love people that you don't know very well because we love you for the same reason that the Lord loves you, because of who you are and who you can be. So I'm giving you this advice literally because I love you, and that is stop seeking for safety and stop seeking for its cousin leisure and start seeking for an opportunity set that will change the world. The only way you can do this is to be committed, to burn your boats, to learn what you can learn while you're on the earth. Remember, it's the only thing you take with you. To learn the things you can learn while you're here, to burn your boats, and absolutely expect to change the world. If you do this, if you expect that turning your loaves of barley and your fishes to the Lord, that he'll break them, and they will feed 15,000, the Lord will step up to the plate. And this is what he'll do. This is by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He says, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That is, that the moment one commits oneself, then Providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never have otherwise occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, rising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no man could have dreamed would have come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.